I decided to look into the importance of women throughout ancient history. And in this series, we started with an in-depth video about the life of Hatshepsut, who in my personal opinion, is one of the most important rulers of ancient Egypt. She was a royal princess who took a rightful place at the throne after her half-brother from a lesser wife passed away. But why was her brother not perceived as a full royal? What does that mean in pharaonic terms? What is a lesser wife? We're going to uncover this all in today's video. My name's Kaylee. Grab a drink, sit back, relax, as I tell you all about this. First, we need to understand the role of a woman in ancient Egypt. They weren't seen as lesser than men. They could own property and even in the eyes of the court were seen as equals. A widow gained even more legal freedom. She could make donations, sell and buy land, and she could even take out a loan. This was the case for women of all classes. Women worked alongside men and noble women usually supervised the servants working in their house and their children's education. Usually male nobles had male workers and female nobles had other women working for them. This is where the separation of the genders is visible, but very understandable. I honestly don't find this to be very strange. I wouldn't want a man dressing me, just like I don't want a man patting me down at the checkpoint. So now we have somewhat of an understanding how women were perceived in ancient Egypt. So how would this relate to royal women in ancient Egypt? Women occupied many important roles in the bureaucracy. They often worked as scribes, as head of a business, doctors or priesthood. There are a few examples of noble women in a high state position at the royal court. The most notable one is Nebet a noble woman who became visor during the rule of Pharaoh Pepi I in the late Old Kingdom in the 6th dynasty. The visor was the second highest state official with only the Pharaoh above them. She is the first recorded female visor in ancient Egyptian history. The following female visor was appointed 20 dynasties later during the 26th dynasty in the late period of ancient Egypt. As you can see, there haven't been many noble women who worked their way into the highest position of the royal court. But how was this for royal women? Before I can answer that, we need to understand how ancient societies used religion as a foundation for society and how the ancient Egyptian religion differs from most. In ancient societies, the holder of the throne had a divine right, anointed by the gods, justifying their rule. Typically, the power was transferred from one male to the next, women only gave birth to their heirs. This meant any woman married to the holder of the throne, the king or the emperor, producing a son, would have produced an heir. The sons inherited the power and continued the royal bloodline. In the cases of the king never producing a son, the throne would then be inherited by a male member of the family, for instance, a cousin, uncle or nephew. In this system, daughters had no claim to power, they weren't seen as important to the system in place. This is vastly different in ancient Egypt. One of the biggest reasons for this is the ancient tale about the dawn of creation and the myth of Osiris. The god of the earth Geb and the goddess of the sky Nut had two children, Osiris and Isis. The siblings Osiris and Isis reigned over the world together as equals. Their sibling Seth murders Osiris and scatters the pieces of his body across Egypt. Isis searches for her husband's body and eventually finds and restores his body with the help of other deities, including Thoth and Anubis. Osiris became the first mummy and this process of restoring his body is the mythological basis of the Egyptian embalming practice. Once Osiris is made whole, Isis conceives his son and rightful heir to the throne, Horus. The role Isis played in the restoration of the rightful ruler of Egypt had a ripple effect into the way the purity of royal blood was perceived in ancient Egypt. Thus, unlike other civilizations, in ancient Egypt royal blood became the unique criteria to become pharaoh. Royal blood, the divine essence that descended from the gods to the kings, could only be passed on by the royal spouse because the goddess Isis was the key to the resurrection of Osiris and his kingship. Without her, they would have never had a royal son to become heir. Therefore, Egyptians preferred to be governed by women of royal blood, rather than a man who did not have royal blood. During crisis of succession, women were able to take on the power of the throne. They would adopt all masculine symbols of pharaoh. And there does exist doubts in some instances about the sex of certain pharaohs who could have been women. 
As an example of royal blood being passed down by females, we have the 18th dynasty pharaoh Amenhotep I, who had no children, or he may have had a son who died an infant. With his death and no heirs to the throne, he was succeeded by Tutmosis I, a senior military figure who could have been the son of Amenhotep I's brother. Tutmosis I married Ahmose, who was most likely the daughter of the same or another brother of Amenhotep I, or even possibly Amenhotep I's sister or half-sister. Because Ahmose was related to Amenhotep I in some way, the union between her and Tutmosis I permitted divine legitimacy. What makes this part of ancient Egyptian rule even more baffling is the fact that Tutmosis I was the father of the royal princess Hatshepsut, who married her half-brother from a lesser wife, enabling him to gain the throne. After Tutmosis II died, Hatshepsut became co-regent to the throne together with her nephew Tutmosis III, who was also the child of a lesser wife. If this part here was slightly confusing and you're new to my channel, I go in depth about the life of Hatshepsut in this video here. I'll leave a link to it in the description down below and I'll put it in the end card. I do highly recommend watching that video if you're at all interested in the life of Hatshepsut and the common misconceptions about her life, her rule and her death. Without a doubt, we know of 19 female pharaohs in ancient Egypt, starting with Nitocris in the 6th dynasty and ending with the death of Cleopatra VII in the Ptolemaic dynasty. And we know that three royal wives played significant diplomatic and political roles. These are Queen Ti, wife of Amenhotep III, Queen Nefertiti, wife of Amenhotep IV, who is better known as Akhenaten, and Queen Nefertari, wife of Ramses II. In the New Kingdom, the Great Wife often had the divine role of Wife of God, or Hand of God. Hatshepsut was the first Great Wife to receive this title. Women in ancient Egypt were often associated with life and fertility. This has everything to do with the goddess Isis as well. She was connected to funeral rites, she was feminine protector and the mother creator. She was arguably the most important deity of Egyptian mythology and it was crucial to maintain the spirit of her image. Her influence extended to different religions and empires where she would be identified under different names. So let's take a look into the differences between a royal wife and a lesser wife. The first wife of a pharaoh would always be of royal blood, to continue the royal bloodline. But the king would have had more than one wife to heighten the chances of getting himself a male heir. But most male heirs were born of one of the lesser wives who would then marry their half-sister who continued the bloodline. The lesser wives were always born in nobility. And then there's the fact that a royal wife would have a lot of influence over the pharaoh, who was usually their brother, half-brother or son in the case of co-regency. They wielded this influence through the fact that royal women were divine too, connected to the gods in their own way. And they played a crucial role in keeping the world perfectly balanced. The royal seed would flow through them, keeping the family line strong, and Egyptians believed that that line should never be broken, so if there were no men to rule, a woman was required to take on that role. They weren't seen as a threat either. Because they were related to the king, it was generally seen as her helping the pharaoh, instead of trying to dispose of him or to make a power grab. Another reason as to why the women made good regents and ruler is because most women aren't violent. So when a king dies and there is no successor or the heir is an infant, it was smart to let a non-violent person take over. The power gap would therefore not be filled by a military general wanting to wage war that could bring the empire in danger. But it would be filled by a woman who would make sure there would be peace until the heir would be ready to take on their role to rule. Ever since the very first dynasty, women would step in to rule until the heir was ready. As we have discussed in the Life of Hatshepsut video, usually when a female ruled as pharaoh, she would eventually be erased from history, or at least try to if she did a damn good job. Or in the case of Cleopatra VII, who was used as a cautionary tale with her mistakes being aggrandized, as she failed in her role as ruler. Women were of the utmost importance in ancient Egypt beyond most people's comprehension in modern times. Because of the royal women in ancient Egypt, it flourished into the great empire as we know it. 
It's a shame that women weren't treated with the same level of respect and kindness in other empires and even in modern day society, women are usually still seen as the lesser sex. Maybe in my lifetime I will see this changed, but we still have a long way to go when we look at it on a global level. But with that said, you've reached the end of this video. If you enjoyed watching, then don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you'd like to see more of these kind of videos, and click that bell icon if you want to be notified every time I upload. If you haven't seen my previous videos yet, then click in the upper right corner, the link's in the description down below, and I've put videos in the end card. I'd also like to thank my patrons, Richard, Barry, Scott, James, Floyd, Prabhu DC, and NGC6543. Thank you for watching, I hope you had fun, and the next video will tie into this one. So I'll see you there. Bye.